Uh, my name is Mark. I am a consultant with Second Quadrant and have been a minor contributor to Postgres over the years. Uh, today I'm going to go over some performance related topics uh, from over the past year and, and uh, uh, specifically the patches that have been committed to the 9.6 branch, a couple of extensions that are available now, and uh, take a little segue into looking at some mainframe performance and pose a, a few paths that Postgres may take after 9.6 is released at the beginning of whatever the next version may be, 9.7 or whatnot. So the first patch I wanted to mention is, or, or uh, everyone know feature freeze in 9.6? If you're sending stuff in, uh, it's going into 9.7 now, or anything new. So the, the first patch I wanted to go over, or mention actually, is just this freeze avoidance patch. Uh, how many people have, have large tables, uh, more than a terabyte? Uh, how many of you fear when that auto vacuum comes around? <laughs> so, uh, this freeze avoidance patch by um, uh, Sawada Masahiko at NTT, what this patch does is it automatically marks rows that have, uh, well, mark rows frozen, so when that vacuum process comes around, it'll if the majority of that table hasn't been changed, it'll fly through that and, and uh, uh, hopefully alleviate any, any tension that you may have when that, when that process comes around. Uh, next patch that's worth mentioning is this atomic pin and unpinning of, of buffers in the shared buffer pool. Uh, the purpose of this is to improve read scalability and has been authored primarily by uh, uh, someone who might have to help me with my pronunciation, uh, Yuri Zerlov with Postgres Professional. Uh, the, what this patch does is that it starts to use, or it, it uses in place of spin locks, uh, the atomic instructions to uh, move the buffers, or mark the, pin and unpin those buffers in the shared buffer pool. So here's a chart that, that uh, Alexander Karatov posted, also wrote Postgres professionals on the hackers list, uh, showing the performance of how 9.6 looked before the, pat before the patches were applied. So that bottom graph down there, uh, th this is from a four socket Intel server with 18 cores per processor, 144 total threads. Uh, anyone have that many cores on their system? No? Uh, one person? All right. Oh, well, mm. well then it may be worth noting that this patch was tested on Intel and Power, and I, I don't know if anyone's tried it on Spark yet. So uh, what, with the spin locks, that bottom line down there with, on the uh, 9.6 branch before this patch was applied, you see it peak at about uh, 70 clients running against the system and afterwards drops fairly dramatically, in my opinion. So in the, the three colored lines are just different variations of, of the patch over, um, over its development. And with these, removing those spin locks and using these atomic instructions, this patch allows the throughput to peak around uh, 130 clients. And afterwards, while it doesn't really um, get any better, it does level off and, and does not drop as dramatically as before. So, so the, 
this patch allows about twice as many clients in, in, a, in a PG bench uh, test to, to connect and, and push the system closer to its limits. And just looking at the peak performance, the, the throughput peaks, um, the peak of the throughput doubles with these changes to the shared buffers. Uh -huh. How many people saw Robert Haas talk about parallelism earlier today? <laughs> All right. So um, I'm really not going to try to repeat too much. Um, Robert, Amit, and uh, Harry Babu, David, among many other people who have uh, helped get this new functionality into Postgres. Uh, what, what, I, what I wanted to do was just kind of illustrate in a slightly different way that how you still need to be careful with this advanced parallelism, or <laughs> the addition of the parallelism, that it's not a, a uh, uh, it's not going to always make everything better. So what, what I have is, is a, well, um, oh, now I forgot who. Sorry, so, someone posted these, these numbers on the hackers list. So what, what they were were a 100 gigabyte TPCH database. Uh, one of the tables, the line item table, table is 80 gigabytes in size. It's going to have 60 million, 60 million? 600 million rows in it. And uh, just, just looking at the, the basic parallel seek scan, just because it simplifies the example, um, what, what we're going to do is just take a quick look at the behavior of, of selecting rows from a table and varying the selectivity. Uh, what happens when we select all the rows, selecting 25% of the rows and selecting 12% of the rows. So, you know, pretty well contrived. We'll just select a, a one of the key columns and do a modulo on the keys to, to see if we want that row or not. Uh, and so in this, in this contrived example, the planner has been modified such that it will always try to do a parallel seek scan, just, just so we can look at the behavior. And if that red line on top, what that's showing is single process, selecting all the rows, it's going to take, uh, what, 250 seconds. And you, you had a second process to, to uh, help divide up that work. You, you end up doubling your response time for that query. And then selecting 25% of the rows, you had a second process. Sure, it speeds it up. Uh, what, about 25%? Start adding more processes to, to scan that table, even though you're only selecting 25% of the rows, response time starts going up. So, so the purpose is just to illustrate that that uh, it's important that we get the planning right and, and uh, between um, how many rows the planner thinks you're going after and how many processes it thinks it should be using to, to perform well. So very contrived, but as this thing keeps improving, probably still need to be careful on, on when it's actually in use. Now this chart shows uh, a little more about how well the parallel aggregation works. Uh, Describe same table as before with the 600 million, 600 million rows, 80 gigabytes of data. Uh, using query one of the TPCH benchmark, which is doing a sum and an average over those 600 million rows to produce only four rows of output. So in this, in this chart, the time axis is on, is on a log scale, just so we can see the behavior a little bit better. The blue line that's uh, going through the, the middle, I guess, is, is the actual response time of running query one as we increase the number of backends that are uh, 
forming a parallelism across the x-axis. So the, the top line, which is supposed to be some kind of yellow-orange, I think, is uh, a percentage on the right side of how far um, uh, the efficiency of the parallelism. In, in other words, if we look at the response time of when one process is performing this aggregation, um, is two processes, have two processes cutting the time in half or not. So what we see is that with uh, the parallel aggregation of these sum and aggregates, the degree of parallelism scales out to about 10, it's fairly close to 10, meaning that, that um, the response time with 10, 10 processes is about one-tenth of the time it took with uh, one process. And then the, the next, looking at um, increasing at the 30 par parallel processes, the efficiency was measured at about uh, a 20% loss of efficiency, still 25 times faster than uh, how long that aggregation took with a single process. So now, just to mention a couple of extensions that may be worth looking at. Uh, anyone use a lot of numerics in their database? No? A couple people? Um, are you happy with how fast it is to do uh, uh, calculations with numerics? All right, so um, just another illustration of that line item table used previously as uh, uh, with 100 gigabytes of data, 600 million rows. Um, there's four of these columns a, in this line item table of the quantities in a line item, the extended price, the discount, and uh, tax for a line item. If uh, all four of these columns were numerics, and uh, yeah, so if, if um, comparing what, what happens with this same query one that's doing an average and, and a sum across uh, these 600 million rows. Uh, sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, to describe that fixed decimal extension a little bit more, um, what this is, is uh, it's using 64-bit integers to provide a, a predefined precision decimal similar to a numeric, where numeric is a, is a, um, a selectable precision data type. And uh, an important thing to note is that with the fixed, de implementing the fixed decimal this way, calculations may be truncated as opposed to rounded in, in case uh, those were issues with, with uh, uh, your normal use with numerics. Um, yeah, so again, uh, just these four columns out of, out of 16 columns in the 600 million row table, uh, we'll, we'll uh, compare how the aggregation goes between having them as numerics uh, compared to fixed decimal. And, um, I feel like I have a slide that disappeared. Oh, oh, I see, sorry. The thing on the laptop is a little too small. So well, with that 22, there's a set of 22 queries in part of that power test. Uh, that chart on the left is a query one that uh, I was describing earlier. So in, in a query like that, the Using a fixed decimal, this fixed decimal data type instead of numeric, increased the response time uh, 
made, made it twice as fast. And uh, in other, in three other, well, a total of four queries out of, out of the uh, TPCH benchmark, which used a fair number of numerics in the queries, also improved the performance fairly significantly um, because of the use of, of aggregates in those particular queries. Some increased as much as three percent, uh, three times, uh, others one and a half times. So now uh, I'll go over a little bit of a replication extension. Uh, how many folks are using Swony or Londis? No one? Uh, streaming replication, how about that? <laughs> All right. Uh, now, how many of you guys, how many guys using streaming replication um, wish you could break it down a little bit more, not, <laughs> not uh, replicate the entire database? And uh, uh, do you guys choose not to use the uh, Wandist or Swony because uh, it doesn't meet it, your performance needs? No? Complication? All right, so um, uh, Thomas Vondrov, uh also at Second Quadrant, he, he did a little test of this extension that that Second Quadrant has worked on called PG Logical. Uh, anyone, anyone heard, kept up with that? All right, so <clears throat> he took it out for a spin uh, using Postgres 9.5. He took a look at how well, well, took a measurement of, of how well PG Bench ran using streaming replication uh, with PG Logical, taking a look at Swilling and Lundy's. Uh, just to give you an idea of the system size, he was using uh, an i2 4XLR JW ins instance, four virtual CPUs, four SSDs attached to the instance, um, 122 gigs of RAM. And this is what he saw. The blue line on the top was what he saw with, with just using streaming or application. So uh, with one client, one client in the PG Bench test, everyone is relatively close and not a huge difference between using streaming replication, uh, Londis, PG Logical. Just setting up two clients, um, everyone's scaling up okay, but then after two clients, uh, Londis, Yes, Wandist has passed its peak. It's already, it's that green line on the very bottom. Doesn't seem to be doing any better as, as we're increasing the number of clients of PG Bench against the, the master node. Then uh, the remaining guys, PG Logical and, and Sloney, are, are keeping pace with streaming replication up to four clients. At which point, uh, Sloney starts to fall off a little bit and, and uh, take a little bit of a dive towards how well Londis is doing at that point. Now at, at eight clients with PG Bench, PG Logical starts to uh, not keep, keep pace though, but, but it will um, continue to keep up a little bit until it reaches about 16 clients, at which um, uh, PG Logical flattens out. So at 16 clients, um, it is interesting where it, where it levels out at that point, at 16 clients. Uh, the, what that sort of shows us is that PG Logical has a 15% overhead from streaming replication to, to keep up with the activity on the, um, the drive of PG Bench. Oh, oh. Um, 
I don't, but I, th I think it's, it's uh, fair to say that the overhead of the logical decoding that's used underneath PG logical might, might is very likely uh, around that. Yeah. So I'm assuming is at the point where it's still when I think it's measure. Yes, yes. So yeah, PG bench is is running against the measure and, and these numbers are, are the results that PG bench are, are returning. Um, but for I'm assuming that like then you have to have a qualifier that says you can't let the you know the destination get behind more than X because otherwise just producing the Right, right, right. Um, so I don't, I don't think I have a uh, good answer. <laughs> I don't, I don't I think, think I know the answer. It's, a, it's an interesting metric. I like it. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, yes. Right. Right. To have a. Right, right. So that means that PG logical uh, is influencing the performance of the machine. Yeah. It slows down the whole machine. The, the whole. Right, 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 right. Um, I'm, I'm not sure where the code pass is exactly, but the, um, I actually wonder if it, oh, I, I probably really shouldn't guess, I probably should just ask someone to tell me, but, but I, I, I was always under, under the impression it was part of the, the streaming part that before it's streamed, it's decoded and sent, yeah. at least. I, I guess I'm just Mm. But uh, again, I think it, 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 it comes down to the question of um, how, how is this test run in such a way so that you're not, presumably, you're not lagging the replica. Right. All right, so I, I, anyone ever had any interest in mainframe? Anyone have a mainframe? No? Anyone ever had an interest in mainframes? No. Yeah? <laughs> so then, then uh, <laughs> has, has anyone seen the pricing of a mainframe? <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> uh, so, so shortly before the 9.5 release, <clears throat> uh, I, I took a look at some OLTP results against a, a Z13, um, which I think is the, what the current Linux one, well, the, the Z13 platform came out, came out and there's these Linux one uh, line that's, that has come out, with some of which is based on the Z13. Uh, ran some tests on the mainframe, uh, took a look at how well it did to a popular competitor. And uh, well, because, because this was shortly before 9.5 was released, we, we actually did these numbers on 9.4, but I hope it would be uh, encouraging to also think that what we see here is going to be repeated on what we would see with 9.5 and 9.6. So a couple basic details. These these Z13 mainframes are clocked at five gigahertz. 
uh, this particular one had eight cores and, and can uh, be threaded up to 16, 64 gigabytes of RAM. The competitive system uh, was chosen also have eight cores, have 16 threads, uh, although these processors were clocked at 2.4 gigahertz, also with 64 gigabytes of RAM. So this, this first test is the result of PG Bench uh, doing only a read-only test. So what, what this is showing here is that um, bottom line is the transaction performance of the competitive system without threading enabled. Next line up, uh, threading is enabled, and we can see that there is a little bit of an increase in transaction throughput. The third line up is what the mainframe can do without threading enabled. And then the um, top line showing that we can still increase throughput on the system by enabling threading on on the mainframe. So uh, comparing the mainframe in this, in this read-only test to uh, its common competitor is, is showing to, that it's able to produce twice the throughput. So similarly, using PGBench to do a simple write-only test, what we see on the bottom is that with the competitor system, the whether or not, uh, the reason why you only see three lines is because the two lines overlapping on the bottom is showing that the competitor system threading enabled or not enabled is, is not showing much improvement for a simple write-only test with PGBench. Whereas the mainframe above it, um, the next line up is the throughput we're able to get without threading and then showing that we can get uh, a little more throughput with threading. Yes? Is there a reason why you're not mentioning the competitor's name? Uh, yeah, usually legally related. Oh, okay. It is not a going to be necessarily uh, uh, condoned by both parties. <laughs> but you're welcome to guess. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so the, the mainframe is showing, um, what did I write on there? Still, even with the write-only test, the throughput is, is, the mainframe is able to get twice the throughput as, as its competitor. Uh, this DBT2 test is a more complicated OLTP type test. It's based on the TPCC benchmark, if, if anyone's familiar with that. And what we're trying to show here is the uh, scalability of a more complex OLTP workload. So as, as we're increasing the number of clients against these two systems, what it's showing that the mainframe is able to more or less keep pace uh, 1.7 times the throughput, almost twice the throughput still of uh, its competitor as, as the number of clients hitting the system increases from 10 all the way up to 80. Sorry, a couple uh, slides got out over here. So at, at this point, I wanted to uh, point out a couple of directions that Postgres may take in the future. Uh, of course, these are not going to be the only uh, things that are going to be happening in development, but uh, these are a couple of things that I have some numbers and, and charts to show. So the first one was uh, uh, First thing I wanted to point out was column-oriented databases. Anyone use any column-oriented databases? Um, and 
and uh, for you guys using them, are you, are you using them because you need to be able to do calculations better than post Postgres can aggregations or whatnot, or massive parallel, massive and compression. And compression. <laughs> so, um, a couple of use cases that that I uh, I'll mention, which of course are not everyone's or you know, people have other use cases for them is. Some people are looking at call more and databases for data warehousing, ad hoc querying, uh, computing aggregates over, over large volumes of data. So um, for those of you using it, I, I would imagine you took a look at the column more in databases because of some deficiency in, in Postgres. Well, I'm assuming that you're all Postgres users here in, in the room anyway. Uh, you took a look at it to, um, because of deficiencies in Postgres and you needed to be able to do more than, than what Postgres could provide for you. So what we're going to do is, is uh, use this dbt3 kit, which is basically a, a TPCH derivative. Um, we're going to take a look at a couple of anonymized column store databases, which again, you are welcome to guess at uh, what they may be. But these are, these are uh, open source column stores. Oh, sorry, was that a? If it was open source, they had to anonymize. Doesn't mean there's still not uh, uh, legal issues to work around. So we'll. We'll call these guys CS1, CS2. All right. Uh, so then we'll take a look at the load test. The, the part of the TPCH benchmark is to see how fast you can load up your database. These are one of the metrics that, that when people review results of these benchmarks that they want to know. So we'll take uh, 100 gigabytes of, of raw data. Um, just to give you an idea of, of what this is, it's, it's eight tables. Uh, in Postgres, it's also in cor uh, part of the load test in corp uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, the building of the indexes is part of the load test in addition to getting the table, uh, getting the data into the tables. And uh, for both of these column stores, building the indexes were not necessary for this to be able to run a, a uh, um, run a power test, which is actually the queries against the, against the data later. So so. Um, in other words, we, we're building the indexes for Postgres because we need them to run the future tests, whereas these column stores do not. All right, so our first column store database was able to load 100 gigabytes in a little more than an hour. Second one took uh, about three and a half hours. Uh, you know, maybe a little twice as slow as the first one, but. But uh, who wants to guess how long it took Postgres to load and build these indexes? 38 days. 38 days. Anyone else want to take another guess? Uh, I don't have any prizes, but it will be fun to guess. 15 minutes. 15 minutes? Almost nine hours. I think the 15 minute guess beats our 15 day guess. <laughs> So, so whether it's because we need to build indexes, whether it's because it takes that long for Postgres to shove that much data in the tables, um, you know, this is two and a half to seven and a half times slower than getting data into a column store. All right, so now we'll, we'll take a look at the power test, that test of running those 22 queries uh, consecutively to see how well they do. Um, my math isn't that good, but uh, I'm gonna, what I'm going to show you is uh, how the score of these power tests are scored by a geometric mean, a weighted geometric mean of, of the response times of each of the queries. So our column store, first column store, scores almost 8,200. Our second column st uh, store scores almost 7,300. Who would like to guess what Postgres scored? 350. 350? 10,000. 10, 20,000. 
20,000. Six, did I hear 6,000? I, I already forgot who was closest, but uh, um, Postgres only scored just a little over 3,900, which is o almost half as low as, as those other two guys. And just to give you an idea, uh, the queries that Postgres were particularly bad at compared to these column stores, uh, these queries were intended to answer questions like, what is the uh, 10 orders, 10 unshipped orders with the highest value we weren't able to collect on. Another one was to query the uh, revenue volume of uh, local distributors of this, of this, uh, uh, this database is about a part supplier data warehouse. So, so um, it wants to see how well each of its local distributors are doing. Um, Another query is supposed to show you which of your customers are having problems based on how many orders they've been returning. So these are the type of questions that, that uh, uh, you're trying to get out of your data. You know, it seems like column stores are able to do these sort of things better. So then the uh, question to pose is, what can Postgres do to close the gap? Um, um, uh, showing one possible path, which isn't really just for closing the gap for column stores. It's, it's uh, uh, talk about Postgres XL a little bit. Any, any uh, users of, of Postgres XL now? XC maybe? Something else that looks like a massively parallel database? No? All right. So uh, Postgres XL is a, um, uh, what's the best word for it? It's the next generation of, of um, uh, implementation that was started by people who have worked on Postgres XC. Have, have people heard of XC or Stato? Um, so, so Postgres XL is a MPP implement, implementation, massively parallel processing database. And uh, it is supposed to be an all-purpose, meaning use it for OLTP workload, use it for data warehousing, um, fully acid, open source, scale out. Uh, the Postgres XL project has just released its, its uh, update against 9.5 earlier this week. For those you might have heard of it, uh, the last time XL was actually released was against a 9.2 code base. So uh, if people have looked at it before, maybe may be interested in taking another look at it now. So, um, before we get back to the numbers of how this thing looks against a uh, data warehouse, um, this chart illustrates the scalability against a simple read-only PG bench workload. The uh, bottom blue line there is the baseline of where uh, 9.6 was at in running uh, PG bench, uh, setting up two nodes. Uh, with PGXL, increased the throughput uh, 1.8 times, almost doubled it, doubling the number of nodes to four, uh, increased the throughput only about three times from the baseline, and then up to eight nodes, it almost gets to six times the throughput of what 9.6 does on a single node. Uh, also take a look at, with updates, Postgres 9.6 on the bottom, uh, two nodes with PGXL. Well, you can, yeah, it seems to be a little bit of a benefit at the lower number of clients, but, but uh, as you increase the load, it's really not looking too much better than a, than a single node with 9.6.
but then uh, when we increase the, the number of nodes to four, we're starting to be able to double the throughput with a uh, with, uh, right up, simple update workload. And again, adding up to eight nodes, the total throughput is about three and a half, half times more. So now, this is what we see going back to the power test uh, and what might be uh, um, encouraging down the roads of competing with column stores. So what, what this bar chart is showing is the 22 queries of the power test and uh, the response times in the lighter blue on the left is what Postgres 9.6 does compared to um, uh, Excel on the right. Oh, a couple other important things to probably mention is that um, the Excel cluster here is uh, 16 nodes. Um, the uh, amount of data here is actually not 100 gigabytes. This is actually three terabytes of data that these queries are running against. So. Um, if someone can help me do math, 100 gigabytes is 600 million rows in that table. Now we multiply by 300. 1 billion 800 million rows. So as, as, as we're getting into the terabyte range, um, Postgres XL is, is showing that it can pull ahead from uh, a single node um, Postgres instance pretty well. Um, and uh, throw out a couple numbers. Um, in case you're wondering, the power score at three terabytes for 9.6 was only uh, about 700. And if you remember, at, at 100 gigabytes, Postgres was able to get almost uh, 4,000. Whereas now, Excel with three terabytes of data it scores almost 4,400. So it's, it's able to score about six times better than. Uh, what 9.6 can do with three terabytes of data. Oh, uh, sorry, I have more slides out of uh, order here. Oh, yes. All right. So, uh, if those of you didn't, who didn't see me flash the answer, um, we'll had some more quizzes. <laughs> uh, did, did everyone see how long it took to load three terabytes of data? Oh, okay. Does anyone like, yeah, we won't guess this one then. All right, so to load three terabytes of data, it took uh, more than 79 hours for, for Postgres to load that and build all those indexes. Um, who wants to guess how long it took Excel to load that data? Okay. 10 hours? Any other guesses? Uh, 16. Three hours? 13 hours. And, uh, yeah, so math says that it, that is five and a half times faster than that. 16 nodes. A 60-node cluster can load data about five and a half times faster than a single node with three terabytes of data. Huh. Oh, sorry. I uh, the same slide as before. <laughs> so that that's all the charts and questions I uh, quizzes I had for all of you. Yes. Can you explain more about Atomic Blockery? Oh, sorry. Uh, explain more about. Oh, oh, oh. Um, so the the buffers in the shared buffer, you have to know if it's dirty, not dirty. You have to make sure you. Uh, sorry, it's not the dirty, not dirty. You have to you have to know whether um, you can pull that out of the or when you're pulling data out or pushing data in, you got to make sure that you're the only one um, touching that buffer. So traditionally, that's used by spin lock and spin lock. You know, the processor just keeps checking. Oh, are you free yet? Are you free yet? Are you free yet? And the, uh, the methodology of doing that kind of test and set 
I, well, no, I'm sorry, that's the atomic operation. So to use the spin walk to see if that buffer is free is um, significantly slower than using the atomic processor instructions like a, uh, I think it's compare and swap. Compare and swap. Uh, thank you. Uh, I had the CAS in my head. <laughs> uh, so, so using those, those atomic operations from that the processor provides is actually a more efficient way of, of being able to say, oh, uh, you know, can I do something with this or not? Uh, any other questions? All right, thank you for listening. <laughs>